Okay, we are recording, and um, we're just going to start chapter two. Can you believe it? We're actually starting chapter two. This is a this is a deal. It's actually on page seventeen, but it's not numbered. So uh, go ahead and flip there. Turbo, are you at all familiar with the first and second halves of life and Richard Rohr's book? I am a huge Richard Rohr fan, which is why I'm here. Uh -huh. um, I haven't read this one yet. I, I just heard about this yesterday. I ordered the book. Okay. I do not have it yet, but uh, I'm, I'm in. All right. Well, you'll catch up with us and you can, uh, you yeah. can read. Also, um, we, we record each of the sessions and so... I'll be emailing those to you. Oh, I need your email address too. Um, okay. Maybe um, uh, Lindy, you <laughs> could email, email me or text me uh, Turbo's email address and then I'll, I'll get her on the list so that you'll get the recordings and you can go back and, I mean, there's a lot of them. So you probably don't wanna watch them all, but uh, if, you, if there's any you do wanna watch, you can, but Thank you. each of these will kind of stand on its own anyway, but obviously mm -hmm. it's also cumulative, but, um, we're going to talk about that he's he just finished in chapter one laying out the first and the second halves of life and, and kind of comparing and contrasting and giving us some examples of how it fits into especially um, our relationship with the church and the connection with the church and how the church has been teaching us. Now we're going to start, we're going to look at the hero's journey, hero and heroine's journey tonight and start laying out how that corresponds with the first and second half of life. So these are all different ways of looking at the same shape of the journey that each of us is gonna be taking from birth to death, but also within that, with every loss and every wounding, we get propelled on another circuit of the journey. So we're gonna take a look at the overall shape. And he uh, starts with a quote from Joseph Campbell. So let's take a look at that. Here's the, the epigram here. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path. Where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god. Where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outwards, we shall come to the center of our own existence. Where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. This is from Joseph Campbell, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. This is a book he wrote back in the 50s. And... Um, He's an anthropologist who really became famous in the 80s with Bill Moyers. I don't know if you remember The Power of Myth, that, that series that Bill did in the, in the uh, 80s with Joseph Campbell. Fascinating stuff. That's where I first got uh, introduced to uh, Joseph Campbell. But back in the 50s, he wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was his way of laying out what he called the monomyth, the story that we've been telling ourselves in countless versions and details since we've been painting on cave walls. And uh, just a, a fascinating book. Rohr is gonna take this, this notion of a hero's journey and overlay it on the first and second halves of life. So here's how he begins. If you look at the world's mythologies in any of the modern collections, you will invariably see what Joseph Campbell calls the monomyth of the hero, repeated in various forms for both men and women but with different symbols. The stages of the hero's journey are a skeleton of what this book wants to say. In some ways, we are merely going to unpack this classic journey and draw out many of the implications that are even clearer today, both psychologically and spiritually. We are the beneficiaries of spiritual and informational globalization like no one has ever been before. Now, I just wanted to pile on to that, that comment there. He's right. There is more information now uh, with, with Campbell and with others about these myths and stories that we've been telling ourselves and how they correspond to the psychological and spiritual journey that each of us is taking. And so we have a lot more information. But at the same time, each and every one of us is born as a tabula rasa, a blank slate, right? Each one of us is born as if memory washed, and we have to take the journey on our own as if it were for the first time in all of human history. Each one of us has that responsibility to take our own journey. 
So even as we have more information about the shape of the journey and the milestones along the way, which is, which is great and important, of course, at the same time, we still have to actually take this journey. So as I was reading this, and maybe I'm reading more into it than um, Rohr was actually trying to put in, but I just wanna make sure that it doesn't sound from that paragraph like it's gonna be any easier for us than it was for Odysseus, you know, or Francis of Assisi, or anybody else in history, because each one of us has to go through this as if we were the only ones who've ever taken the journey. What we do have the benefit of, though, is a book like this, and, and books like Campbell's, and, and other books that are helping us to get a better sense of the shape of the journey and all those milestones along the way. Because I'm telling you, the better we understand um, the terrain, the map of the terrain, the easier it will be for us to stay on track. And I found this especially true for myself when I finally started to understand uh, and got familiar with the hero's journey and rites of passage, classic rites of passage. It made it easier for me to be able to uh, get through a lot of, of the difficult parts because I could still see myself on the path and not somewhere in a ditch. And so that pain and those difficulties made, were, were, were more overcomable because I still could see that it was part of the process. And so to have more of that kind of information can help, but it's still an experience that each one of us has to take. And one other issue, maybe in generations, centuries, and even millennia past, where the stories were highly mythologized and uh, you know, stories of gods and goddesses and heroes and all that, that needed to somehow filter into our consciousness in terms of the journey that each of us is taking. Now we have more rational accounts of what this journey looks like and, and, and the shape of it. But each one of us is gonna have to move back into that non-rational space as we take the journey. Because if we stay super rational about this and, and objectively thinking about it the whole time, we're gonna miss the whole experience of what the journey is all about. It's not a rational cognitive journey that we're taking here. It's, it's a visceral and purely experiential journey that we have to completely go all in on if we're really going to be able to complete it in the way that, it's, that life is presenting itself. So I just wanted to make a couple of those comments. I don't know if they help. If they don't, never mind. <laughs> any, uh, any thoughts or comments on what I just said or what Roar just said? All right, then let's carry on. Next page. The pattern of the heroic journey is rather consistent and really matches my own research on initiation. Those embarking on this journey invariably go through the following stages in one form or another. So here's the first one. They live in a world that they presently take as given and sufficient. They are often a prince or a princess, and if not, sometimes even of divine origin, which of course they always know nothing about. This amnesia is a giveaway for the core religious problem, as discovering our divine DNA is always the task. Remember, Odysseus is the king of Ithaca, but, but does not reign there until after the second journey. Two. They have the call or the courage to leave home for an adventure of some type, not really to solve any problem, but just to go out and beyond their present comfort zone. For example, the young Siddhartha leaves the walls of the palace. Siddhartha is Buddha, right? St. Francis goes on pilgrimages to the Muslim world. Queen Esther and Joan of Arc enter the world of battle to protect their peoples. Odysseus sets out for the Trojan War. Three. On this journey or adventure, they in fact find their real problem. They are almost always wounded in some way and encounter a major dilemma. And the whole story largely pivots around the resolution of the trials that result. There is always a wounding. And the great epiphany is that the wound becomes the secret key, even sacred, a wound that changes them dramatically. 
which, by the way, is the precise meaning of the wounds of Jesus. Their world is opened up. The screen becomes much larger, and they do too. Our very word, Odyssey, is now used to describe these kinds of discoveries and adventures. Odysseus answers the story as a man alone weeping on a beach, defeated, with no hope of ever returning home, where he would be a hero. That is his gnawing and unending wound. It's also unfair, because he was a hero in the Trojan War. Four, the first task, which the hero or heroine thinks is the only task, is only the vehicle and warm-up act to get him or her to the real task. He or she falls through what is merely his or her life situation to discover his or her real life, which is always a much deeper river hidden beneath the appearances. Most people confuse their life situation with their actual life, which is an underlying flow beneath the everyday events. This deeper discovery is largely what religious people mean by finding their soul. Five, the hero or heroine then returns to where he or she started and knows the place for the first time. As T.S. Eliot puts it, but now with a gift or boon for his people or her village. As the last step of Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous says, a person must pass the lessons learned on to others or there has been no real gift at all. The hero's journey is always an experience of an excess of life, a surplus of energy with plenty left over for others. The hero or heroine has found eros or life energy and is more than enough and it is more than enough to undo Thanatos, the energy of death. If it is authentic life energy, it is always experienced as a surplus or an abundance of life. The hero or heroine is by definition a generative person, to use Eric Erickson's fine term, concerned about the next generation and not just himself or herself. The hero lives in deep time and not just in his or her own small time. In fact, I would wonder if you could be a hero or a heroine if you did not live in what many call deep time, that is present, past, and future all at once. So what I want to do then is kind of go back now and let's take a look at each one of these again and maybe break them down a little bit, make sure we kind of understand the, um, each of these stages of the journey. Um, but before I do that, are there any thoughts, questions, things you want to talk about at this point? Uh, Tony, you're muted. Yeah, after you get through what you're just going to do, can you take uh, the stages of Jesus's life and mark each step for us in, to, in relationship to the hero's journey? Yeah, we can try to do that. <clears throat> okay. Sure. Um, Let's go back to page 18 and number one here. Okay, so this is where the journey is starting out. And think of the, the transformation stories that you have read. And of course, uh, my, my favorite one that really checks all the boxes is Dorothy Gale and the Wizard of Oz. Okay, that's, that's a perfect example of a hero's journey. And um, for Dorothy, she's living in black and white Kansas. It's all she knows. It's her life. We don't know what the backstory is. We know that she's not living with her mother and father. She's living with her aunt and uncle. And we know that she's useless on a farm. You know, she just doesn't do anything that's worth anything. And she's just kind of always in the way. She's a dreamer. She's always dreaming of something better over the rainbow someplace. And she longs for that. So she's unhappy, but she lives in the world that she presently takes as given and sufficient. It may not be sufficient to her, but it's all she knows, and it is the world. It's familiar. It makes sense to her and to the hero. She, they say they're often a prince or a princess, and if not, sometimes even of divine origin, which, of course, they always know nothing about. This is a lot of the Greek myths, you know, stories of, of sons and daughters of the gods, and they don't know who they are. Um, what is it? Uh, Sleeping Beauty. Um, you know, she's a, she's a, or Cinderella is, is a, a princess, but doesn't know it and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of these stories that we have, these archetypes that are showing us this. 
There, there's that divine DNA that Richard Rohr is talking about that we know nothing about. And it's through the hero's journey that we actually find out who we are. The hero or the heroine finds out who they are. This amnesia, he says, is a giveaway for the core religious problem as discovering our divine DNA as always the task. Remember, Odysseus is the king of Ithaca, but does not reign until after the second journey. We use the, uh, the image of, of uh, Michelangelo's horse. Remember, Michelangelo is commissioned to sculpt the horse and he's given a block of marble and he walks around the marble until he can see the horse standing in the stone as if frozen in a block of ice. And when he can envision that completely right down to the last vein and muscle, then he says that the only thing left to do is remove everything that's not the horse. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about the fact that this finished kingdom person, this perfect person that we were born to be is already standing within us as if frozen in a block of ice. And so the task of our hero's journey, the task of our spiritual formation is simply to remove everything that is not the true self, that is not really us. And so it is a journey of subtraction as opposed to addition. And this idea that there's something precious already here, already inside. Remember what Dorothy says when she finally gets back to Kansas after her journey through Oz. She says, next time I go looking for my heart's desire, I'm not going to look any further than my own backyard. Because if it's not there, I never really lost it to begin with. And so, again, this is giving voice to that idea that everything that we need is already here. Everything that we are is already here. I was talking on Sunday about this journey being and Jesus' way to the Father is really a way of remembrance. It's a way of remembering who we are and have always been, that we're born saved, quote unquote, meaning that we're, all, we're born as loved and accepted as we ever could possibly be. And what we need to do is to remember that by chipping away all of the, the false things that have been accrued because of fear and because of the traumas that we have encountered along the way. And when we can strip those back off, then we're back where we started again. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a, a important part of the journey, this beginning that we're, we think the world that we have, this familiar world is all there is, but that's gonna get stripped away in this, this journey, this cycle that we're going to take. And when we come back to where we started after the journey, we're going to know the place for the first time, as T.S. Eliot puts it, because it's going to look very different to us. And we will have a very different relationship with it and with everyone in it. Okay. Thoughts, questions, anything? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So the second one, they have the call or courage to leave home for an adventure of some type not really to solve any problem, but just go out and beyond their present comfort zone. For example, the young Siddhartha leaves the walls of the palace. Francis goes on pilgrimages to the Muslim world. Queen Esther and Joan of Arc enter the world of battle to protect their peoples. And Odysseus sets out for the Trojan War. And we can think of Dorothy. What happens with Dorothy? Well, she has a threat to her dog, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the dog is going to be taken away, so she runs away from home with Toto, and she gets as far as Professor Marvel's, you know, wagon or whatever, and he shows her that his, her aunt is worried about her, so she goes back only to have the cyclone take her away to Oz anyway. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't know what she's about. She has no idea she's going to take a journey. She's trying to save her dog, but all the circumstances kind of uh, turn into her, her trip to Oz. And when she's deposited in Oz and everything is full color, then she realizes that she's gonna have to deal with this world in a very different, very different way. So if you think about Dorothy, think about some of the other stories you know, and maybe you can um, chirp, chirp in here and fill them in. But remember uh, Neo in The Matrix? Mm -hmm. it makes, it's the same idea here he has the nagging sensation that something is wrong with the world something isn't right and he's looking for it he's trying it's it's a it's an itch in his brain that he's trying to scratch and he does it through the computers and he, he's thinking something's going on and then he gets the call 
you know, from the computer screen and follow the white rabbit. And then eventually he has to choose between the red and the blue pill. And so you have the same kind of call to this journey that's going to change everything. Everything he thinks he knows, everything that is familiar is going to be challenged and he's going to have to give it up if he really wants to take this journey. Luke Skywalker, Star Wars, you got the same sort of thing going on. He's, he's kind of like Dorothy. He's on Tatooine. He, it's a desert planet. He hates it. He doesn't want to run a moisture farm. He has these ideas that he's supposed to be more than this. Something is calling him from, from the stars and eventually everything conspires to pull him out of that world and set him on a path that he needs to actually negotiate somehow. Mm -hmm. And it changes him completely and changes his notion of the world. And uh, Tony was asking about Jesus. We have big gaps in the story of Jesus. So we don't have the same kind of detail that we have in some of these others. But at some point between 12 and 30, uh, we, we don't have any information about that. Jesus is called out on his own journey. And if you think about it, he would have been taking over for his father, the family business. He, as the oldest child, would have been his mother's right hand and taking care of his mother after his father apparently died, because we don't have any more information about Joseph. But he's called to go out. The spirit impels him at some point to go out into the wilderness. And this is the same call to the journey that we see in these other stories that Jesus is compelled to go out and he starts his journey. And the story of the wilderness with the three temptations, everything is, is that beginning of the stripping away of everything that he thought he knew and that world that was familiar and comfortable to him, at least to a point. And, and we can continue that on at a later time, but see that the beginning stages of these stories all have that same motif. And now as we're talking about this, start to connect that with your own life, because this is where this is going to get meaningful. We're all sitting here in a, in a discussion group based in a church that is deconstructionist in the sense that we're trying to look at our faith in a different way, trying to understand it in a different way. What caused you to be uncomfortable enough in your previous situation to want to join a group like this? to be part of a group that is willing to tear down the familiar walls and see what life really is all about. What was it that, that made you feel that there was something more that you needed to explore? Was there a specific incident, event, a wounding? Was it a gradual thing? You know, what caused you to want to move into a different space? and challenge everything that you thought you knew before. Did you have any idea what you were getting into when you started this journey? Or has it started to unfold and you're just now finding out how deep the rabbit hole goes? You know, Alice in Wonderland, another hero's journey, right? So, but start relaying as, as we go through these stages and as he develops this further, think about how that relates to your life as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can see yourself on the journey. Here's the most important thing. We're each the hero and heroine. We're the star of our own movie. Make sure you're not a, you're a bit player in your own movie, all right? You are the star. How does this relate to the shape of your journey so that you can more and more intentionally and consciously take that journey? That's the whole point of it. All right, I did a lot of talking. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, please, <laughs> someone else talk. Well, so for, for myself, 15 years of sobriety and that, you know, coming into AA, if anyone's familiar with recovery, I know there are a few here and, um, you know, there comes to the point where, again, we have to make a decision, turn our will and life over the care of God as we understand him. And, uh, you know, that seems pretty heavy duty, important, you know, part of this. Um, I start going to church because I got to figure it all out in my head if I'm going to do this. I got to be safe. Um, don't want to make any bad decisions. I've made plenty of bad decisions up there. And uh, yeah, I went through a process. Just got, you know, proverbial fire for Christ and stuff. Um, you know, got into ministry and service and stuff. And everything was going really, really well uh, until basically started understanding that it was Saddleback Church. And it was very, if anyone's familiar with, very evangelical. And I started realizing that my evangelism 
was very egotistical. And actually, evangelism on a whole is very egotistical, at least from my perspective. Now, I, I certainly could be mistaken, but it was basically, I have a worldview, I have a belief system, and I'm here to convince you that this is the correct one. Mm -hmm. Once I framed it up like that, it just, oh, it was, again, it was a very uncomfortable moment. Um, but as we, you know, I'll probably heard the truth will set you free, but also it'll, it'll upset you a little bit too, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's about the time I came to the effect. Um, there's some other details and stuff. I could turn this into a speaker meeting and, and stuff there. But yeah, how I came to the effect is started realizing that as much as I am in love with um, my idea, my story, the, uh, the narrative that I have that of Jesus and of God, that um, is the most attractive thing I've ever seen. My life has been transformed. It has been experiential. Um, a lot of what is it was being taught in, you know, the Mariners and Saddleback, they're the two, two big South Orange County. Basically, that standard operating procedure of non-denominational Christianity just wasn't holding water for me anymore. So even though I kind of had the, the gut punch, um, I was still attracted to this enough that I didn't want to just dismiss it and, and just say that it's all a bunch of blarney and, and stuff. And, you know, some people might, you know, default to saying, well, there is no God kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, here I am. I don't know how long it's been since, uh, roughly 10 years. Not a, you know, not a regular attender and, and stuff, but I, I, I love, love what it, the, the effect is about. I love the people of it. And uh, yeah, it's the, been this destruction, uh, deconstruction of this unlearning of a lot, again, of the narratives that are so, the pillars. And, again, and they, again, Settleback makes no secret. They call them the five pillars and stuff. Right. And uh, things like seeing how the preoccupation of the there then everything is about the purpose driven life. If you haven't written, read the book yes. is, is uh, about the purpose of life is preparation for heaven. Now, I'm not going to disagree that anything I'm gleaning from this reality is beneficial in the next. But on the other hand, again, anybody who's been around here long enough knows that, uh, you know, we, we're oriented toward about the here now. And again, not it's as tempting as it is to go on and on about this because I am passionate about this. Um, yeah, you know, this whole thing has been rather revolutionary. Um, I feel at times that I don't fit in with my, my atheist um, uh, humanist friends, although frankly, I feel more inclined with them than necessarily those that proclaim Christianity because... Like myself, it's very much about a, a, a just a mere mental agreement. You know, I've got some scripture memorized. I can connect the dots. I, it's a logical explanation of my faith. Um, and certainly there's enough experiential that, that it's sustainable and stuff. But what we're doing and we're describing, my latest thing is coming to the conclusion. I, I've been basically doing a condensed version of the um, the 11th step prayer, um, St. Um, Francis, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. Mm -hmm. And I am really, really right now, I am committed <laughs> to being a channel of the spirit and therefore have the Christ, the energy of the Christ, the arrows flow through me. And, and there's part of me that goes, this is audacious, this is crazy. But frankly, I, I, right now, I'm, I'm really kind of getting to the point. At least I feel safe enough to talk about this stuff. I wouldn't talk it about others because mm -hmm. that would be for some Christians be blasphemy. There's only one Christ. And I don't want And I'm a little bit familiar with Mormonisms. They're talking about, you know, how um, elders in the church are, you know, are, are prophets and stuff. No, this is, again, the love of God being so with me. This, again, this is kind of, I guess, what I say is like advanced thing of dot, God. <laughs> The teachings here that Dave talks about is that, you know, our goal is, is unification with our, our father, with God, with the universe. And, spirit. and I'm kind of getting to the point right now where it is. It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And if I'm crazy 
go again. I'll pursue this one long enough till I'm in the straight jack or you put me on Thorazine or whatever and stuff. But it seems pretty cool right now. And hence why I'm recommitting to being part of the community here. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, Randy, yeah, yeah. that kind of reminded me. Um, in fact, Dave, when you were when you're reading that earlier section, I found myself thinking about my early time studying with the Jehovah Witnesses when I was like 13. And if I can think of that, this uh, that is the beginning of my spiritual hero's journey. Like I was really into the witnesses and really liked studying and going out and knocking on doors and things of that nature. Um, and then I just started to rebel against it for some reason. And I, Randy reminded me of this when you were talking about kind of butting up against some of the pillars within the, within the philosophy. Um, but I'm now wondering if after all the studying we've been doing and moving away from this dualistic place of being, if I can actually go back to the Jehovah Witnesses and have a very different relationship, you know, or if Randy can go back to Saddleback and kind of view everything from a completely different lens kind of deal. Um, and I was thinking about that whole idea of, you know, Dorothy coming back home and, you know, what that would look like. And I don't know if I can go back home. Um, but anyhow, that kind of popped into head. Well, <laughs> is, is home a, super, a certain denomination and, and belief system? Mm. To be, I, I don't know if I ever thought of that as home, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I, I'd be curious to see, like, if I went to the Kingdom Hall today and sat through a message, if I would, you know, register the same objections or if I would hear it, you know. In a different well, way. My thought is probably you won't. You wouldn't. Because what, what happens as we continue on this journey is that we, we really start to see things less dualistically. We're not, we're not in, in, in the knee-jerk position of having to um, contrast one thing with another, compare it and judge it and, and, and completely objectify it. But we see it more through just the, uh, the prism of, of just pure connection. You know? yeah. And, and I, I think you would probably be able to fit into that community much better. Because when I think of the reasons I rejected, it was because I was literally, I was interpreting the teachings literally and having, having my own literal, like my 13 year old reading of scripture objections to, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, like everything is fully dualistic and it only means one thing which is my 13 year old understanding of things so I'm sure it'll be different but uh, I wonder if I can read it and just not have any of those <laughs> rough <laughs> edges because there were a lot of rough edges back then. Quite possibly. <laughs> And I know I frame this in, ter in, in terms of the effect and, and uh, the religious community or religious community, the faith community that we're, we're under the umbrella of right now. But um, I don't want to just restrict this to theology because this is really um, about our whole lives and, and everything that comprises our life from an existential point of view um, through to relationship and, and theology, of course. So we are being called to that second half of life. We're being called out of what we've known uh, in the first half and as children that is comfortable and familiar out into something that is wild and woolly and there's, there's munchkins and witches and dragons and all kinds of things. And we don't understand how the rules work anymore. And we have to try to find our way through this new world of the adult and this new world of the, uh, the person who is really trying to live life in terms of unity, rather than just 
comparing and contrasting from a more uh, cognitive point of view. So it really is a complete shift. And, and we're taking that on all levels, not just religion. That's just a, a, that's one part of it. So I wanted to make sure that we broaden that out as we think about the, the shape of our own journey. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, in, in, if you didn't catch it, it's a lot about me reconsidering my identity. Yeah. And therefore my entire world. Mm -hmm. So thanks for bringing it. Yeah. Anything else? Well, let's take a look at the third one again. On this journey or adventure, they, the hero and heroine, in fact, find their real problem. They're almost always wounded in some way and encounter a major dilemma. And the whole story largely pivots around the resolution of the trials that result. There's always a wounding. And the great epiphany is that the wound becomes the secret key, even sacred, a wound that changes them dramatically, which by the way, is the precise meaning of the wounds of Jesus. Their world is opened up, the screen becomes much larger and they do too. Our very word odyssey is now used to describe these kinds of discoveries and adventures. Odysseus enters the story as a man alone, weeping on a beach, defeated, with no hope of ever returning home where he would be a hero. That is his gnawing and unending wound that it is all so unfair because he was a hero in the Trojan War. So here's where we're getting the first inkling that there's much more at stake here than just the, the specific tasks that we are about. So in the hero's journey, once the hero or heroine accepts the call and moves into this new world, they're immediately confronted with all sorts of things that they don't understand. There, there are new types of beings, the, 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 the laws of physics don't apply anymore. I mean, everything has changed. And usually what happens is that the hero or heroine is, is provided with a guide, some, some sort of ally who gives them tools for the journey, things that they can use, and then also with tasks that need, need to be performed before they can come back from the journey. So again, I like to use Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Gale in The Wizard of Oz because everything is so clear there. The first thing she does is encounter Glinda, the good witch, right? And Glinda is the one who gives her the ruby slippers. And the ruby slippers are her ticket home, although she doesn't know anything about them and nothing is explained until the very end. And then she's only told that she needs to follow the yellow brick road and go see the wizard. And when she does that, the wizard gives her the task of getting going and bringing back the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. And so all of that is what is propelling the story forward, the task that she needs to complete in order to be able to go back home. And the whole time, she just wants to go back home. But what she finds along the way are her traveling companions, right? The Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, and the Lion. And as she continues on the journey, what she's finding out is that these are the representations of her own intelligence or intellect, her compassion and her fortitude, her bravery. And whether she realizes it in the process of the story or later is that the real task is developing those parts of herself that she already had, but had not exercised, didn't know anything about in a conscious way. And so at the end, as her traveling companions get their, their gifts and their boons, you know, they're not getting anything that they didn't already have. And she's not either, but she's finding that the deeper task is the development of herself from the inside out. And so this is what he's talking about here. She finds the real problem. You know, the real problem is she hasn't fully exercised who she is, which is why she always felt uncomfortable, out of place and on the outside looking in, in her world in Kansas. And when she comes back, there's a, there's a new connection that can be formed and she can actually be of help to the people around her. Making sense? Yeah, Dave, I'm wondering, um, you know, this is written in a specific format, but I'm also thinking that just the aging process sets us up for this kind of adventure, if you will, um, without us perhaps 
leaping into it, right? Like our physicality alone uh, starts shifting in ways that moves us into uncomfortable territory. And that's assuming that you know, we've made it to a certain age without having had some um, experiences already with physical limitations. But in that way, we're all the same. In that way, we all have that universal opportunity as we age um, to begin to discover some of the wounds. So that's number one. And number two, this feels so um, exacting. Like in my mind, in my, my experience, it's more like there's one wounding after another. I mean, it's not like it's just, oh, there's the wound. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, more, it's more this sort of treasure hunt into um, new ones that appear as one goes along. And um, I don't know. So for me, it, it, it's, I think it's presented in a more subtle way. Um, mm. That certainly has everything to do with aging. Um, so, mm. and you're, you're making, you're making great points. And, and that needs to be stated is that obviously when we tell a story, everything is compressed, right. And, and, and characters are compiled and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's neat and it's tidy and it has to get done in uh, two hours <laughs> so that we've got it all. And, and it would be nice if life was that, that, uh, you know, distinct in terms of all the transitions, but of course they're not. And the main, the main hero's journey is, is really the journey from childhood into adulthood. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. The world of the child has to give way to the world of the, the adult. And so if you think about a child moving in adolescence into the world of the adult, into a new world where all the rules don't apply, where they can really get hurt because before they were kind of covered in their parents' home and everything is changing at that point. What you're seeing is that initiation. That's why he, he equated this with his research on initiation, primarily male initiation, but female initiation works in its own way, different symbols, like he said. But that movement from the world of the child to the world of the adult is the call of, uh, of the hero's journey. But you're also right, Becky, that it, it never stops happening. Every loss, every, every grief journey that we have to take is another hero's journey. And it's gonna be experienced that way. And we need to keep taking these journeys in that kind of corkscrew or spiral that we were talking about, cycle after cycle after cycle. And if there's anything that we have left undone, if there's parts of our lives that we really haven't explored, then old age is gonna catch up to us. And it's gonna make sure that the job gets done um, if we're at all willing. In other words, the, the call to the journey keeps on calling. Uh, Joseph Campbell uh, has a great uh, section in there where he's talking about what happens when you don't answer the call. Because the call to this journey is happening to us you know, from, early, from childhood on. And if we don't answer the call, it, you, you move into this gray kind of space where um, you know, life doesn't make any sense anymore. And there is no sense of meaning and purpose or real identity. And um, it's, it's a, a pathetic place to be is what Campbell is saying, because we're just stuck. I likened it to camping outside the gates of Eden. I mean, another hero's journey is uh, Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden of Eden. You know, their answer to the call, of course, is to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when they do, they're expelled from the garden and they can't go back to that previous world that was familiar and comfortable because the way is blocked by the angels with the flaming swords. And so they're forced to go forward. But if you're too afraid to go forward, if you won't answer the call, you remain just camped outside the gates of Eden and no further, um, no further movement is, is afforded you. And so we're always answering the call. There is always another call forward. And so, yes, it's, it's messy and it's complicated and it won't have a lot of these clear signposts along the way. But I think it's still useful for us to be able to, under, if we understand the shape of the journey, we can apply it to where we are in life. And when a trauma has occurred, when a loss has occurred and we're being forced on another cycle, um, we can realize that this is going to open up our world even further. It's gonna show us depths of ourselves and of those around us 
that we hadn't been able to grasp before if we will consent to the journey. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's like that, Becky. So you, I, I think you're right on with that. Um, I like this idea that it's, it's all so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's kind of built into whatever that first part of the journey looks like um because it yeah i mean i think that makes perfect sense but i wanted to ask what what exactly is he talking about the wounds of jesus there like is he referring to something specific or just well he says there's always a wounding, you know, in, in all of these stories, there's, there's a wounding of some kind, um, whether it's, it's emotional, psychological, or actually physical. In the initiation rites that, that uh, Vora was talking about, uh, the, young, the young boys are taken out of the company of the women and children in the village and taken out into the bush, and they have some kind of, of ritual or rite there that, that includes some kind of pain, usually a cutting or a tattooing or something. There's some kind of pain involved. And so the wounding is always symbolic of the, 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 the separation, you know, the, the loss of one world at the expense of the next world. And then he says, these wounds become the secret key, even sacred, a wound that changes them dramatically, which is the precise meaning of the wounds of Jesus. You know, the Jesus ordeal on the cross and the wounds that he received there were what opened him up to a whole new world, a whole new state of being, which is what it now is doing for us as well as we enter into that same kind of acceptance of the wounding to accept the wounding as part of the process not to fight it not to try to minimize it or avoid it in some way is part of the process of this journey we need to accept the fact that in our vulnerability we're going to get hurt and it's the only way forward so that's another another part of jesus hero's journey as well. Did that capture it enough, William? Um, I appreciate you talking about the continuous nature of <laughs> the trauma, the wounds. Um, you know, Brady and I, I think both in childhood and, and then and, college and so forth, you know, there are for wounds. Um, you know, I think, you know, kept the face for sure, but, um, you know, didn't pay much attention and just kind of, you know, kind of go with flow and you get hurt and you, and you go on. Um, and we thought we both were, and that continued, you know, we both went through divorces and all, all kinds of stuff. And so the, there were, there were just lots of traumas and wounds, but I, I, absolutely understand that each one broke open me and him a little bit more. And, you know, when we got married in 2000 and I moved out to Arizona from Indiana, we thought we were, we were doing great. <laughs> we were just, you know, man, we were going to church and we were in the covenant group and we were doing so good and we were, and then, you know, 2008, this deadly cancer hits and, you know, then prostate cancer and it breaks you open to the depths, you know, for him, as you guys all know. And then for me in 2015, you know, just the uh, toxic mold, Lyme disease broke me down and opened me to, um, you know, huge, huge, huge transformation. And so you think, Oh, well, I've kind of arrived right now, you know, and <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So, um, I, you know, when we talk about the journey, it's it, the journey. It's like your, your whole life. And I guess we have we have talked about that. But it's like, you know, you think, OK, maybe this will be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and it never is. But the blessing is it breaks you open more to to God and, and to, you know, to the soul, your own, your, yourself, and, you know, the horrible trauma that maybe came as childhood and you realize, in childhood, and you realize, maybe I'm not so bad after all, you know, and there's some good in there. So anyway, it just, you know, the journey, 
I had in my mind, you know, we, we read this many years ago, but I didn't remember because I was a whole different person. I really was. And so now it's like, oh, there are multiple journeys. There are multiple traumas. <laughs> but each one, um, for us anyway, for Brady and I, has certainly opened us massively, which has been good. So thank you. <laughs> It's always good in retrospect, though, right? Because oh, let me tell you. <laughs> when you're oh. going through it, it don't feel so good. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it was pretty ugly, and I got pretty angry <laughs> mm -hmm. at God. But I think, I think he, she can take it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and if we start to understand that the wounding is the integral part of it, that the wounding is what does open us up, then even in the midst of the pain, at least we can keep a shred of our, of our awareness around the fact that this too is growing us and opening yeah. us up and allows us to have the strength and the wherewithal to continue on the journey. Whereas, um, you know, we, we might get completely broken or be tempted to, to run back to the last stage to where we felt safe and where we felt more secure. And if, if we can resist that and keep moving forward, stay present, lean in, um, then like Jesus said, this seed, unless it falls to the ground and dies, it can't fulfill its purpose. And that is a perfect example of what we're talking about here. If we resist the very thing that is going to give us our flowering purpose, then we're always at odds with ourselves in life. And understanding the shape of the journey can help us to stay on track when things really, really hurt. I love what's been said um, so far in all of this. Um, you know, it's make me reflect on, you know, kind of doing a scan through my own life. And, um, you know, there, there, were, there were things as, um, Beth, you mentioned, you know, in childhood that um, were woundings, family of origin, um, encounters with um, church authority figure, figures that were very traumatic. Um, and, and at each juncture, um, just moving along, I, I, I feel like, you know, at each juncture, there, there were points that I, I chose a different path, but it was, it was motivated by different things. It might've been motivated by fears. My ego was still kind of in, in development, you know, in those, in a lot of the early years of my life. And it was, it was developing around protecting myself and then in later years finding my way into new woundings and new help <laughs> um you know i it, the the story of dorothy is just so cut and dried i i, I relate to that and you know i did, i did, never had one um good witch in my life, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> but I was, I was fiercely going after um, many good witch authors <laughs> that seemed to have some wisdom to share with me and um, helped me through those, those really difficult, um, my adulthood years and, you know, started realizing, you know, the, the, the empty spots in the drive to ambition and success and all of that kind of spot, this kind of thing. Um, and, and questioning even, even more deeply, is this all there is? I mean, geez. Um, and feeling that, that emptiness. And, you know, at each juncture, it, it, broke open new awareness and and new spots of resistance in me and also you know this push pull kind of deal going two steps forward and three steps back um 
but I, but you know, I think developing my relationship with God came in, in that, in those middle years, really, when I, when I started, um, working on the anger I had, um, at the Catholic church mm-hmm. and starting to break that open a bit more and looking at the, the tough stuff around the trauma that I went through and, and along the way, just started discovering a, a very different God than the one that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And that, that was, that was a powerful force that, that has carried me up to this day and it is still changing. And and there've been times when I've still encountered situations when I've I've been shaking my fist at God (laughs) and just just saying, you know, well, you know, you told me to do this and I'm doing it. I have no idea how how to do this. So you're gonna have to intervene here. Oh man. And, and you know, um, um, remarkably enough, um, he delivers. <laughs> I've just been so, you know, I've become so much more aware of those, those little things that happen that are huge things. You know, I, I, I came to terms with there are, there are no coincidences is my belief. Um, you know, and, and has been for many years. And I, I do see how God works in me and other people, in my, in my kids, in my husband. Um, and I'm, I'm trusting that he's going to be working in my grandchildren's life, you know, way after I'm gone. Um, and and that is that that is a lovely place that I find myself in right now. And it's not to say, you know, I've been one of the fortunate ones so far and not having serious physical um, health issues. And I and I'm sure there's gonna be something down the road for me too. Uh, as you said before, <laughs> none of us get out of this this life alive. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's going to come in one way, shape, or form for sure. But um, I'm I'm becoming less fearful of that, and maybe it's easy to say when I'm on this side of it rather than in the middle of it. Um, you know, and I appreciate the wisdom of some of you in these these rooms that that. Are, are getting through that, that stage too, um, with greater love and acceptance and, and understanding. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm unpacking a lot of the aspects of myself that I think have been, that were survival skills that got me through life to a certain point, but are, are now constraining me. Um, in great measure and Mm -hmm. and it's been so helpful to go into that um and it's not to say that it's not hard you know to see those shadow aspects of myself but at the same time it 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 comforts me that all of us have those you know mine might be different from yours or randy's or ellen's or whatever but um We all have them and it is a continual choice to go into that and to enter in and to start discovering what what feelings, the full range of feelings that I do have and that I can feel in my body Um, and, and, starting to unnumb myself, I guess, um, in much deeper ways than I used to. Um, you know, so it's, I, I'm, 
slowly starting to accept the fact that there are going to be a series of woundings. But there, there are also, you know, the, the depths that I can enter into when I go into those decent places um, just make me more susceptible to the joy that is also present, you know, in in the little things, in the mundane things, in the in in the sweet things that are said to me, and um, and and help help me realize that my my life has meaning and purpose. Um, and so I'm the living in the present has really helped um, increase the the intensity. I think in which I, which I'm living life, and yet, and yet coupled with relaxation and rest, and you know, respect for myself and its limitations, my body and my feelings, and um, what I do to take care of myself. So that's great, Judy. You know, jumping off of what Judy just said, and and also what Becky said, basically. As soon as we find ourselves in a life that is comfortable and familiar, it's time for another hero's journey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, that, that's, that's basically what this comes down to, because we're ready now for the next growth spurt. We're ready now for the next breaking open that will take us to the, the and then when that all, when all the tumult and all the disturbance of that kind of calms down and everything sure. becomes familiar and a little bit complacent again, that's the time for the next trigger to break us into the next the next journey you know but i think you know they, they, they don't have to be big or world shattering traumas it doesn't have to be cancer beth don't worry you know <laughs> but just enough just that's enough. where my mind went I, that's where my mind went. <laughs> just enough to challenge just enough to pull back the green curtain so you can see the little man working the controls that tells you that there's another there out there there's still more out there and if you're willing to take the journey again, and, and as you take more of these circuits, you, you can do it better and better. It doesn't have to be quite as, because you're not resisting anymore. You're not fighting it every, every step of the right. way. You're now moving with it. And yet you're still growing and you're still challenging and you're still breaking open and all of that. So that is the cyclical nature of the journey. We have the one huge one, the main story arc from birth to death. But inside there, there's all of these circuits that we're taking with, with each wounding that is challenging the world we think we know. And if we're willing to let that challenge stand, we'll keep growing. And every time we take the circuit, kind of like Judy is saying, you're seeing more and more of the beauty of life and more and more of the joy of life, even in the smallest things. And now we become the sage. We become the person who actually has something to give back to the community and make that community better, make it more cohesive. And that's the whole purpose of this. We have to be in a position where we can give back, which means we have to keep coming back to where we started and knowing the place better each time. So, if, yeah. if I can just take a second, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that it's related to what we're talking about. I'm not gonna uh, likely be here next week. I'm uh, having a surgery on Tuesday. It's nothing life-threatening, but it, uh, in, in the terms of what we're talking about, what I'm having to face is what has always been a gift for me and something I have pride in, which is my self-reliance. Mm -hmm. And so instead, I'm having to take a look at and begin to claim um, dependency, mm -hmm. which is not something that I've ever treasured. Uh, or valued. So um, I will be stoned on pain meds next week. So while it might be entertaining, I won't be here. <laughs> oh, come on. We want to see. Yeah. We don't mind. <laughs> but, but we know you can I'll, dance on tables, Becky. <laughs> I'll, I'll be working on that old dependency thing. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks for letting us know, Becky. And we're sure, all going to be with yeah. you in spirit, of course, uh, for that. In fact, uh, Scott, maybe as you uh, close us in prayer, you can 
offer something up for Becky and Doug as well. Absolutely. Father God, I'm just so grateful to be here again tonight, just fellowshipping, learning more about you and your ways and the hero's journeys, the first half, second half of life, and also coming to you with our petition and prayer for healing for Sharon and Becky and Doug and just all, all of us. We've all got woundings. We've got challenges. We've got things we're going through, financial, marriages, relationships, jobs, homes, economy, the war, the presidencies. There's so much to pray for, Lord. We can pray nonstop. And since I know you know it all before I even speak it, I've learned with my relationship with you that I pray we all have to just depend on you, to really turn these things over after we've given it the best we can with whatever we think we should do to help in any situation. But teach us when and where to stick our nose in, Lord, and where to keep our business to ourselves. Help us to help each other, love each other, and encourage each other as you've encouraged and loved us, Lord. In your holy, precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. We give our thanks and say our amen. 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 So Turbo, welcome being thrown into the deep end of the pool. Are, have you been sitting in your driveway for the last half hour? <laughs> I have. I figured. Yeah, watch it get dark. Get, on. It got dark. I turned my little light on. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. I didn't miss anything. Oh, Thank great. you for being with us and, and yeah. uh, get the book and hope we'll see you next week. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's bro you guys are brilliant. Thanks for sharing. Uh, oh, thanks for being here. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Yeah. Good night, guys. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Hey, Sherry, are you there? Oh, she's gone. Okay, Jordana and Linda. Good night, you two. See you Saturday. Sunday. Okay. Bye.